Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next panel, the impact of changes in credit availability and usage. Um, our first paper will be the marginal propensity to consume out of credit, presented by Dennis Iden. And where's the point? <coughs> Oh, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for having me here. So this is a very simple paper where I study how consumers react to credit shocks. Suppose that you pick up your credit card statement and you see that your limit has been increased by, say, $5,000. Now, how much of this could you go ahead and borrow? And how much of the amount that you have borrowed actually translates into spending? So the amount you borrow on your card that becomes spending is called the MPC out of credit. And this is what I measure in this paper. So I'm going to skip why this is important. But firstly, if we had a good sense of what the magnitude of this MPC was, we could use this to test apart competing models, ranging from the permanent income model, where credit has no effect on behavior, and the rule of thumb model, where some folks increase their spending one for one for credit. Second, the heterogeneity of this MPC by, say, age, income, balance sheet position is an important statistic to formulate fiscal policy, monetary policy. And finally, if we understood what or why are people using credit, are they borrowing when they're productive to invest? or are they borrowing when their income is low to smooth and durable consumption, then we can use this to better design credit markets. So the crux of this paper is going to be identification. I'm going to go to a retail bank, and I'm going to design and implement a field experiment where credit lines are going to be deliberately varied to 50,000 people. So this is going to be a bank that already does these experiments on their own to improve their pricing. We're going to call from the chief economist's office, the credit card sales group, take these 50,000 people, put them into bins, assign everybody a random number, and if the random number is below the cutoff, we're going to exclude these guys from future limit increases for something like nine months. And the remaining of the 50,000 people, about 40,000, is going to be pushed for limit increases. So the basic event study is going to be something like this, where on the x-axis you have time. The experiment is implemented in September 2014. On the y-axis you have interest-bearing credit card debt, so everything that I'm going to show in this paper is going to be interest-bearing debt for probably most of you. You're not using your credit card to revolve debt. But then I'm going to analyze the aspect of the spending response. So for example, in this graph that I see that these consumers are increasing their borrowing by about 600 in the local currency, that's about $200. So I'm going to focus on normalizing this to get a value interpretable as the marginal propensity, analyze its heterogeneity, and look at its composition. The nice thing about the results are Compared to the literature that measures the MPC out of income, that is, how does consumption response with respect to income shocks, because I have a large sample, a large shock, and an RCTD, results are going to be very precise and very robust. I'm just going to do a treatment control analysis. But building on the literature that measures the borrowing response to credit shocks, I'll have a lot of balance sheet information. So I'm, I can look at, say, are these people borrowers, lenders? Do they have unhedged rate exposure, so on? But I can also see why they use the credit. And secondly, I'm going to use these findings to test these competing models of intertemporal behavior. So ideally, this paper is best given by nesting all these models, showing how each of them have a distinguishable prediction that tests that model apart compared to the others. But for the sake of short time, I'm just going to talk about these models. First, the permanent income hypothesis. So I'm going to give these consumers credit, and I'm going to see that they increase their borrowing and their spending. So in a model where consumption is proportional to lifelong wealth, or in a model where these borrowers are only bounded by the natural limit of their lifelong resources, the MPC out of credit is going to be zero. Second, you can argue that the deviations from the permanent income model for the average consumer can be explained by a small fraction of credit-constrained consumers, or those that follow a simple rule of thumb or up against their limits, and the average sensitivity is driven by the small set of constrained folks. When I analyze the heterogeneity, it's going to be clear that the average response of consumption to credit is not going to be driven by 15, 20% of the population. There are going to be people with 80% of their credit line slack. They're going to increase their borrowing quite a bit. And that's exactly going to be in line with Deaton's and Chris Carroll's buffer stock model. If there is uninsurable income risk, you never want to max out on your credit card. So if I, if I increase your borrowing limit, then you're going to increase your spending until you draw down these precautionary savings. So qualitatively, the fact that a change in the credit regime is borne by even the unconstrained guys, although it's exactly in line with the buffer stock model, 
quantitatively, the magnitude of the response of the unconstrained guys is going to be an order of magnitude larger. This is going to bring up questions as to if these guys are myopic, because the easiest way in these models is just jack up the discount rate. But then when you follow these people over time, when you analyze the longitudinal features of the data, you're going to see that models like David Leibson's beta delta model or any buffer stock model where the discount factor is high, although it can account for how much people borrow with respect to an income shock, they won't be able to account for how quickly they save their way out of that. So the best model that explains all of these findings is going to be a buffer stock model with illiquid durables and one-sided adjustment costs. The reason I'm saying one-sided adjustment costs is, unlike the recent Kaplan and Violente model, you'll need a model to explain the boom where a lot of the consumers are spending on durables, even with respect to small shocks. And then, of course, this model can be incorporated into a macro framework to understand consumption booms and household leveraging. There has been a massive surge in papers that take the correlation between the MPC and various balance sheet positions on hedge rate exposure, so on, to devise optimal fiscal policy, monetary policy, macroprudential policy. And finally, for the um, relevance with respect to the Financial Protection Bureau, it's very important to understand that some people are borrowing when they expect their income to rise, and some people are borrowing when their income is low to bring home the bacon. But to get started, this data is going to come from a retail bank. So this bank is classified as the top 10 credit, credit card platform in Europe, and its, bank's popula its uh, customer base is representative of the bank population. I'm going to have about six types of data. First, the credit card variables. That's going to be the spending that you do within the month, your end of month balances, the payments made towards those balances, and the balances you revolve across pay periods. I can also categorize the expenditures by linking the POS machine in the merchant and then assigning it to one of the 18 categories. I'll see the liquid assets these guys have at the bank, not outside the bank. And I'll also see the mortgage debt, personal debt, and auto loans both inside the debt from the bank's administrative data and from the credit bureau that's mapped to it. Importantly, I'll see these guys' labor income. So unlike data sets where you have to integrate these from the checkings account, trying to data mine or word mine um, transactions that are labeled like payroll or uh, direct deposit, this is going to come directly from the accounting statement of the company and demographics. So the sample size is going to be something like 10 million, and the unit of analysis is going to be an individual. So these experiment participants are going to be 54,000 people that are pre-approved by the bank for a limit increase. These guys are selected by the credit supply function, where the bank first looks at, is it profitable to extend another dollar of credit line to you? Then they don't want to bug you all the time. So if you've had less than six months since your last limit increase, or if you had your card for less than two months open, you're excluded. Then there are three proprietary scores. They, look, they track your credit card behavior, your payback behavior, your demographics affluency. And then if you have non-performing loans and late pay days, then you're excluded. So this is like a filter that if you pass all these groups, then you are eligible for a limit extension. Finally, there's a macroprudential policy in this environment where the credit card limits have to be below four times the most recent stated monthly income. But the experiment participants are going to be folks that pass all these criteria. So out of these 54,000 people, we're going to select a control group that's going to be 13,000 big. And we're going to exclude these guys from future limit extensions. And the treatment group is going to have their limits extended by a median 120% of monthly income. These in increases are initiated by the issuer, and they're not announced. And there's not going to be any change on interest rate or other features of the contract. So I'm so about if these folks are selected or not. The first row is a subsample of all the customers at the bank. The second row is the experiment participants. The participants are slightly younger. They make about 10% more income. But as you can see, their pre-existing limits are lagging behind. So if I give the experiment participants the limit increases a part of the experiment, then they would be catching up with the cardholders in terms of their typical limit. So these are guys that have been, did not face a limit increase in the recent few months. So this is the event study that I showed you. On the x-axis, I have time. This is when the experimental intervention started. The y-axis is your interest-bearing credit card debt. I normalize this by the pre-intervention value, this d minus 1. So this change in the stock is going to be the cumulative spending. As you can see, the treatment and the control, they're identical before the experiment. And after the experiment, 
they increase their borrowing by about 600. That's about $200. So I'm going to normalize this with a distributed lag model. On the left, I'll have the change in debt. On the right, I'll have the change in limits. I'm not going to control for anything else because the delta L is orthogonal, and the MPC is going to be the cumulative response after tau months. Just one thing, the magnitude of the limit change is not going to be random. So who is in treatment versus who is in control? You guys are in treatment, you guys are in control, that's random. But the magnitude of the limit change for the treatment group, that's not going to be random. But I have the perfect instrument. I'm going to instrument this changes in limits with an indicator for if the person is in the control group. So this is the MPC out of credit. I give the impulse at time zero for all of them for nine months. The y-axis is the fraction of the additional dollar that you have borrowed. What do we see here? First, folks accumulate about two cents on the dollar in the first month. The quarterly MPC, I'll use this to calibrate, is about 13 cents. And it asymptotes to about 17 cents on the dollar. A few things to notice. This response doesn't happen slowly. In a model with non-durables only, if this credit is used to bring home the bacon again, this response would be slowly increasing, but instead these consumers react bam. Secondly, this is the MPC out of credit, so this bounds below the MPC out of income. A one lemma that you can use is the difference between the MPC out of credit and income is proportional to your response to permanent shocks multiplied by the annuity factor. So the quarterly rate, if it's 6%, then add 6% to it to get to the MPC out of income. Of course, this is the average response, which masks a lot of heterogeneity. So what I'll do is I'll look at the cross-sectional response after three months. And this is the cross-sectional graph. So on the x-axis, I have the credit line utilization. If you are a consumer who had a limit of 10,000, you're not borrowing, you're zero. If you're a consumer, your credit line is 10,000, you're borrowing 2,000, you're at this point. The right axis is the MPC after three months. Also ingrained is the histogram. So one bunch of things to see here, first the heterogeneity. Of course, consumers who are up against their limits, these are guys who are at the corner solution. The laws of economics are not holding for them anymore. So their MPC is as high as one. And of course, you can redo this graph with their balance sheet position, their unhedged rate exposure, anything related to fiscal policy, and you got your sufficient statistics. But what was striking for me is that when you look at the response of the unconstrained guys, these guys have 80, 90% of their credit line slack but they're still accumulating eight, nine cents on the dollar. So this is what I found very interesting, that this, although in line with the buffer stock model qualitatively, this response is quantitatively an order of magnitude larger than what the buffer stock model would predict. That's what I meant by this brings up questions as if these guys are myopic. So you, look and look, you can look at their spending patterns. I'm gonna skip this, but this credit card uh, in this country, there's two types of debt that you can accrue. The installment that is something like you go to an Apple store, buy the MacBook, and pay it back like a mortgage contract. And the revolving debt is the classic American style uh, revolving debt. So a lot of the debt is going to come, sorry, um, in the form of installments, and that's going to go to durables. But again, analyzing the spending patterns, what I do in this graph is I, so suppose the treatment group spend $100, the control group spend $50, the difference is 50 bucks. I allocate that 50 bucks into different categories. At the top, you have non-durables. The red bars are the sum of the categories. The second is durables. And at the bottom, you have services. So as you can see, only about 15% of the spending response in the installment goes to non-durables. And that goes to mostly groceries. But a lot of the spending response goes to durables, things like furniture, clothing, electronics, appliances. I always debate with my advisors as to if clothing is a durable or not. But if you buy a parka, that's going to last you for 10 years. But I mean, it's clearly not day-to-day -day expenses and similarly services like insurance, tourism, health and education. The final thing I want to show you is this is not identified by the experiment, but I think this is very important because most of you are interested in the dynamics of the balance sheets. So I wanted to answer the question, what fraction of the bank's customers are persistently constrained? Like who are the people that want to borrow but they're unable to? Of course, the definition of constraint being that they're maxed out on their credit lines. The interpretation of this paper is everybody is constrained because they always leave a buffer of credit availability. But to answer that question, what I did is I took the customers of the bank. This is a representative sample. So if there are 10 million customers, I take a 50,000 subsample, and then I put them into bins at time zero. At the top, you have guys who are constrained, and at the bottom, you have guys who are not constrained. So look at the behavior of the constrained guys. Just three months before, I mean, you can do this with the experiment participants or the bank's typical customer. It just gives the exact same graph. But the folks who were constrained at any point in time, they were not constrained just three months before the binning. 
Something happened, a temporary event, maybe they accumulated durables, they got a negative income shock, they accumulate that, but then they quickly save their way out of that. Secondly, if you want to take this pace at which they deaccumulate that, so if the typical credit line is about, say, three months of income, that they need to be saving one month of income to reduce their utilization after a quarter to two thirds, that would imply that the discount factor has to be really high. That is, these guys appear very patient when they're saving their way out of that. And the second thing I wanted to look at is, what fraction of the people are just persistently stuck at the constraint month after month, they're unable to pay it back? Of course, a lot of these guys have debt, but who are the people that are maxed out and stay there? So about 5% of the people at any point in time are at the constraint, and this graph plots the percentiles, the 10th, the 25th, the 50th, and so on, of the guys who were constrained at time zero to see where they end up being in, let's say, three months, six months with respect to utilization. So of the 5% of people that were constrained, only 10% of those guys remain at the constraint in month three, month six, so on. So the fraction of the population that utilize their credit cards to the max and remain there month after month is no more than 1% of the population. So this is how the myopic model, in my opinion, and according to um, kind of a model with no heterogeneity, just cannot explain these dynamics. So then what I do in the remaining part of the paper is um, just um, nest all these competing models um, and then put them on an axis, where on the left you have models that predict zero sensitive to the credit, and on the right you have models that predict that spending is going to rise one for one with credit. At the left you have the permanent income model, where take the certainty equivalent version, you're like a university's endowment fund, you have $3 million, you spend the annuity factor. So in that model, if you give somebody credit, it entails no wealth effects, therefore it's not going to change their behavior. So the permanent income model predicts that there's not going to be an effect of credit on behavior, but the buffer stock model, a buffer stock model with durables, myopic model, and the rule of thumb model are going to predict that the MPC is going to be positive. Second, when you analyze the heterogeneity and see that the unconstrained guys are also responding, not only they're responding, but if you accumulate the response, a large sensitivity of the response is driven by folks who are not constrained. Well, that is not consistent with the rule of thumb model. The, the Campbell and Mankiw model, which has been recently used by Egertsen and Krugman and like, Koronek and Shimshek to study household leveraging dynamics, that predicts that the sensitivity of credit is going to be driven by 10, 20% of the population. And then how much can the buffer stock model deliver the quantities? Well, the buffer stock model is going to predict the quarterly MPC of maybe 2%, 3%. And you can jack up that discount factor and go into the realm of myopic models. But in that case, you're not going to get the mean reverting utilization. So the only model that's consistent with all the findings is going to be this buffer stock model with durables. And if you incorporate this to a macro model, there's going to be a lot of different implications with respect to almost any policy question. So I'll just cut off here. That's OK. All right, next we'll have Andres Lieberman from New York University presenting High Cost Debt and Borrow Reputation. Um, so thank you, thank you for putting our, our paper in the program. This is joint work with um, Daniel Paravicini and uh, Vikram Patania. How does, how does this work? Ah, there we go. Um, so let me, let me motivate the talk. We're going to be talking about high-cost unsecured consumer credit. It's going to come as no surprise that this is a source of short-term borrowing for constrained households. We're thinking of anything in the range, you know, if you plot the range of APRs, anything in, going from credit cards, uh, lines of credit, overdraft uh, from bank credit accounts, all the way up to payday lending and even higher, uh, higher uh, interest rate sources of credit. Um, and it has been documented in the literature by, in particular by some people that are, that, that are in this room as well, that the use of high cost credit may cause a financial distress in the future. Um, and it should come as no surprise also that this, is, this has been an active area for regulation mentioned by John Campbell in a presidential address a couple of years ago. Uh, in particular, some, some examples, the Colorado payday regulation, the UK high cost repayment caps, the CFPB proposed rules on payday lending in particular, and uh, research has uh, has, has fit into these, these regulations. I mean, one prominent example, the Gatherhood et al. paper 
is cited as one of the reasons why the UK, in fact, enacted these high cost re uh, repayment caps. A typical argument behind these, uh, these regulatory actions is that uh, the borrowers of these high cost unsecured uh, loans are unable to calculate the burden of repayment ex exposed and therefore ex ante they enter into loan contracts that are, are, are therefore going to harm them. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to uh, present a set of results in which we investigate a different channel linking high cost credit with future financial outcomes and this channel is going to be credit reputation. And the basic idea is the following, if the average user of high cost credit is a high, pro high probability of default individual, then people who take uh, these high cost loans will be tagged as risky, um, independent of their repayment. Now, if in addition, credit outcomes from high cost lenders are public information, borrowers may become credit ration just because the information that, that they took a loan from these high cost lenders becomes public. And because they become Russian, they may enter into financial distress. And, and the idea here is very similar to Gustavo Manso's JFE paper in 2013, where he investigates how firms' distress may actually be impacted by credit rating agencies' uh, uh, rating changes. Okay? And this is kind of a multiple equilibria kind of idea where you know, if everybody coordinates into a bad rating, then the firm itself suffers. The same idea for individuals. And so some uh, kind of, this is the best source of evidence uh, taken from the internet, so, you know, a quote from the head of consumer affairs by Experian UK, some lenders might see the fact that you've taken out a payday loan as a sign that your finances are under pressure. This is something that the market tends to recognize as well, but there is no uh, academic evidence about this effect. So because this effect exists, if we're able to prove that this effect exists, borrowers may face a trade-off between alleviating financial constraints today and exacerbating them in the future because of a bad credit reputation. So what's the empirical strategy to try to isolate the, the, the result? And as I explained the empirical strategy, I'm going to also document the, what I think the two contributions that our paper brings forth uh, to the literature. So we track the full repayment and credit history of all first-time applicants to a high-cost lender in the UK for the years 2012 to 2014. And our first contribution is that we're going to measure what I'm going to try to convince you is the causal effect of taking up a high cost loan from this lender uh, using an, an identification strategy that I'm going to get to in a couple of slides. And what we find is an immediate negative and lasting for at least one more year a drop in credit scores, where credit scores summarize reputation to, uh, to the market. And we also see that in the future, although, although at the time of the loan we see no evidence of financial distress, in fact defaults, if anything, go down, suggesting people are credit constrained initially uh, and they are in a high marginal utility of, of consumption situation where they need to borrow. We also see future financial distress and we see credit rationing from the formal, from the formal banking sector. So uh, you know, I made a drawing to, to kind of uh, uh, exemplify the mechanism we have, we have in mind. This little individual uh, uh, takes up a high cost loan. This leads, and this red arrow is the mechanism that we're after, leads to a drop in credit scores, and that leads to rationing and financial distress. So this evidence that we present is consistent with the take up of the high cost loan actually being viewed as a negative signal by lenders, who then restrict access to credit, which leads to financial distress. The empirical problem is that this evidence will also be consistent with what the previous literature uh, suggests is the negative causal effect of high cost loan, which is that it causes financial distress because borrowers cannot handle the high burden of repayment. And here the channel goes through a different arrow. So imagine if my red arrow doesn't, wouldn't exist in that drawing, you may still find the correlations or the causal effect that we're going to be documenting in the data if high cost loan causes higher default which would lead to more rationing and more financial distress, irrespective of whether there's a direct channel between the high cost loan take up and uh, the credit score drop. So how can we isolate this reputational effect? And this is the, this is the empirical strategy. We, the, we expect the average effect of take up on the credit score to be large. So credit scores are essentially the result of a regression of anything that the credit bureau can observe uh, of default on anything that the bureau, credit bureau can observe. So if take up of this high cost loan becomes one of the right hand side variables, then it's going to have an effect on credit scores. If the average user of high cost credit is where this uh, dashed line appears, then on average, the average effect for people who are relatively to the right uh, uh, in terms of credit scores, they're going to have a high, relatively high effect on their credit scores. But at the same time, people who are close to that threshold already, because their ex ante credit score is relatively low, are going to have a negligible or maybe even positive effect of their credit scores once they take up a high cost loan. 
So we're going to try to isolate the reputational effect by exploiting this heterogeneity. So our second contribution of this paper is we're going to disentangle the reputational channel from this burden of repayment story by measuring, again, the causal effect of high-cost loan take-up among the lowest credit score applicants. And consistent with our, with our prior, at least, uh, we find no effect of take-up on, on credit scores. And crucially, we find no future credit rationing and no future financial distress. Okay? So when we don't see our red arrow happening, that question mark on the right-hand side, the answer is that we're not seeing rationing in financial distress. And we conclude then that when the reputational channel is shut off, the use of high-cost debt does not cause rationing or distress uh, in, a, in our sample for this particular lender. An alternative explanation that I'm going to explore if I have time is that marginal applicants are just different, and I'm going to ar try to argue that this is unlikely to explain, to explain this result. Okay, so now I'm going to spend some time just explaining to you how we measure the causal effect and then how we measure, how, how we disentangle this reputational channel from the burden of repayment. Let me tell you a little bit about the lender. This is a for-profit lender, operates in England. It has a big online presence, although we're going to be focusing entirely on the physical. So they have, they have stores, they have branches where they also approve loans. We're only going to be focusing on the physical pres uh, presence because the, uh, the, the online presence is fully automated. So... For the purposes of identification, it's not going to be useful. They have 24 retail stores staffed by loan officers. These branches are staffed to match the local cultural composition of the community that they serve, in particular the language and the country of origin of that community. These loans are unsecured, short-term, high cost, no question about that, 600% median APR, fixed installment weekly, and there's top-up any time after one month. What is top-up? You take a 100-pound loan, you pay 10 pounds, and after a month you can go back to 100 pounds if you're, if you're uh, on time in your in your pay, thanks. What is the approval process? So for first-time applicants, this is why we focus on first-time applicants. For second-time applicants, it may be different. The loan officer observes snapshot of the applicant's full credit history in real time, then interviews the applicant, and then obtains additional information, like employment status, wage, and debt to income, and then decides, crucially, to approve or reject the application. So very quickly, some summary stats for first-time applicants. 67% of, of applicants end up in loan take-up. These people are relatively poor, have relatively low credit scores. Think of credit scores in the same range as FICO scores in the US. So 800 is good, 300 is bad, 500 is bad. Not as bad, but bad. Uh, annualized rate in the order of 600% median. As I said, the bread and butter product here is a six month 200 pound, uh, six month 200 pound uh, loan, loan that ends in a 34% uh, in default, with a 34% probability in default. So let me show you just a time series of high cost loan take up. This is not identified, it's just averaging um, credit scores centered at zero at the time of application. This is at the, by quarterly level. The dashed line corresponds to people who take up a loan the, the, among applicants, and the, the continuous line corresponds to people who did not take up a loan, either because they were rejected or because they, they didn't want to take it. And what we see is that relative to the non-takers, the, the people who take up a loan see a massive drop in their credit scores, and it happens in the quarter of application, and it's persistent. So how can we estimate this causal effect? Of course, this correlation that I showed you in the previous slide is not causal. So we want to estimate something like future credit scores on a dummy for take-up. This, this is endogenous. So what are we going to exploit? We're going to exploit a lender policy by which new applicants at a given branch and at a given date and of a given nationality are randomly assigned to loan officers. So this is the ideal experiment that I want you to have in mind. Two guys enter the same branch on the same day. They're Polish and they're going to be randomly assigned to the two loan officers that, assi that see Polish applicants in that branch. Uh, and in turn, these two Polish officers vary in their natural propensity to approve a loan, what we call leniency. So one of these Polish officers is much more lenient than the other. So we're going to, following Will Dobby and Jay Song's uh, AAR paper, we're going to construct a measure of loan officer leniency, ZI, as an instrument for loan take-up. So if you're assigned conditional on, on branch by nationality by date, if you're assigned to, more len to a more lenient loan officer, you are more likely to end up taking up a loan. This is the, this is the construction of the instrument. It's irrelevant and I don't have time. Um, uh, what is necessary for identification, so the, what I want you to keep in mind is that a more lenient, uh, if you're assigned to a more lenient loan officer, you should be more likely to get a loan. This should be the first stage. If we don't have power there, then this instrument is worthless. The exclusion restriction is that the only reason why your future credit scores and your future financial situation may be better or worse is because you were assigned to a more lenient loan officer and nothing else. And monotonicity, 
is the idea that if you're assigned to a more to a more lenient loan officer, you are more likely to uh, take up you are more likely to take up uh, uh, a loan. Okay, um, so this is the first stage. That line there uh, represents the relationship between leniency and take up. So people who are assigned to a more lenient loan officer have a, a higher probability of taking up a loan. The slope of that relationship is 0.22 percent, 0.22. So if the standard deviation of leniency is roughly 0.1, that means that if you're assigned to a one standard deviation more lenient loan officer, you have a 2.2% higher probability of ending up with a loan uh, over a baseline of 67%. Uh, what about the exclusion restriction? It's an assumption, but what I would have to show you at the very least is that leniency is uncorrelated with anything about the applicant that's observable at the time of origination, and that is the case. We run a regression of leniency on observables, controlling for this very granular branch by a date of application, we use the week of application by the nationality of the applicant, fixed effects, and we find that there's, there is no correlation, apart from a very minor correlation with being male um, uh, with, on leniency. Um, and monotonicity, we, we provide some evidence in the paper. So this is the uh, specification that we want to run, changing credit scores on take up, and we want to instrument take up with leniency controlling for these fixed effects. And this is the baseline result. Uh, on the quarter, again, quarter zero corresponds to the quarter of application. We see a 4.7% drop on credit scores. This is the causal effect of taking up a loan relative to not taking, it, taking up. And again, this is persistent. Four quarters after the application, we still see a 10% drop in credit scores. Um, so sub, let me just summarize the results. I'm not going to have time to go through all of the tables that we, sh that we show, but we see what I showed you, the immediate and permanent drop in credit scores, but we also see lower defaults initially, but more default in the long run. Uh, we see more search for outside credit. How do we measure search? The credit bureau actually documents when people search for a loan. This is like a pool of your credit, of your credit record. But we see no increase in the level of outside credit, and if we combine these two measures in a ratio of search to credit, and call this rationing, then we, then in fact, we see much more, that people are much more rationed when they take up this loan. Um, and we interpret this to be consistent with the reputational channel and with the burden of repayment story. Okay, so these are my, my tables, they're there, I'm not lying to you. How do we disentangle the reputational channel? So we're interested in the effect on the borrower with the worst prior, just like I showed you in my drawing, with the lowest credit score, that's the worst prior, that can still get a loan. And we conjecture that reputation is least likely to be affected by a bad signal for this particular type of borrower. The first idea would be to run the same specification that I showed you, but conditioning on low credit score applicants. It doesn't work. There isn't enough power in the instrument to do that. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is we exploit the minimum credit score cutoff in a regression discontinuity design. It is a fuzzy RD, not sharp, because loan officers have some discretion. So let me show you in a graph how we're going to be identifying. So if you plot credit scores on the x-axis, People with a credit score of 399 and a, a credit score of 400 look very similar on everything else, except that if you're at 400, you're much more likely to get approved for a loan and therefore to end up taking up a loan. Uh, there's this ugly dot, dot at 399, but this is empirics. What can I do? Uh, the first stage is approximately 25%. So people to the left of the cutoff, if they move to the right of the cutoff, would have a 25% higher probability of end up taking up a loan. And we're going to use, use a standard uh, latest technology on RD estimation, local linear using optimal bandwidth. So uh, for identification, we need histogram to be smooth. We need the covariance to be smooth. A histogram is jumpy just because the density is not very high around this cutoff. Uh, so the McCrary test, in fact, fails. But if you look at the covariates, all of the covariates are continuous at the threshold. Uh, and we also, in the histogram, we don't see any notorious accumulation at either side of the threshold, which gives us confidence that, in fact, we're going to be picking up this causal effect. Um, so let me, let me show you the credit score results, which are not there. We don't see anything. If anything, taking up a loan from these guys results in a higher credit score on the quarter of application, although not significant. And there's no action even after a year later. And then again, let me summarize the rest of the results, zero effect on credit scores because the reputational cost of receiving a high cost loan has already been paid. But we see no change in default or in search behavior, and we see no evidence of rationing or distress for this group of borrowers. So in conclusion, the effect of high cost loan is heterogeneous, depends on the initial credit score, and it's much more parsimoniously and consistently explained with the reputational channel, um, at least for our set of results. Uh, there are the results. Uh, what about an alternative interpretation? 
So the alternative interpretation is that people with low credit scores cannot be compared to people with average credit scores, even if they're applying for the same loan. So the question we need to answer here is which characteristics might make bad reputation borrowers less vulnerable to high cost loan take up, right? So we see less distress caused by take up among the low credit score population. Is it a story of burden of repayment? So these guys are just better at handling the burden of repayment. That seems to be unlikely. Low score borrowers are poorer. They are more constrained. They end up defaulting more. So if anything, you would expect the burden of repayment story to be a little bit tougher for these, for these individuals. Would they have more experience handling high cost debt? So we condition uh, our RD results for people that don't have any short term debt and we find the same effect. So it's not about experience managing these types of, of loans. And crucially, in my opinion, such alter alternative story needs to assume that the low score borrowers would default less with a high cost loan, which is kind of inconsistent with the way the credit score is sorting people. I mean, uh, even if it's from an ex-ante perspective. And again, as I said, the reputation mechanism explains this heterogeneity parsimoniously. So to conclude, uh, what do we find? High cost credit affects future financial health. This effect is heterogeneous. It depends on the borrower's prior credit reputation. In particular, we find that the financial health of borrowers with a poor prior reputation is unaffected. This is consistent with the effect being mediated through reputation. What about regulation? Well, we haven't said anything about uh, rationality. So rational borrowers will choose to be credit ration tomorrow if today's marginal utility of consumption is sufficiently high. On the other hand, we have a lot of evidence that people are not always rational, or some people are not rational. Uh, uh, and so consumers may be unaware of or unable to evaluate this trade-off, and therefore some regulation may indeed be warranted. But this self-fulfilling and self-reinforcing nature of the effect, right, because their credit score drops and so you're going to be trapped into this cycle of not being able to borrow and being financially constrained in the future may lead to a poverty draft. So one of the things that we find interesting is that one of the proposed CFP rules asks about analyzing the ability to repay a particular loan. For that, you need to actually pull credit information. And so this discloses that you're actually wanting to take a loan from these, from, from these people. And, you know, this, if you take our, our, our results seriously, this, this may actually cause some harm to the people that uh, want to borrow these types of loans. Thank you very much. Okay, our next paper will be presented by Diego Jimenez um, on mitigating the risk of financial inclusion with loan contract terms. Hi, um, so first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for accepting the paper into the conference. I'm actually very happy to be here. So, um, wait, next. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a large randomized control trial that happened in the Mexican credit market. The study population for this randomized control trial is individuals who are relatively new to formal credit, and I'm gonna define this in, next in the next slides. And we're gonna observe experimental variation in contract terms. And what I mean by contract terms is interest rates and minimum payments. There's quite a few papers that have studied uh, variations in interest rates, but to our knowledge, this is one of the first ones that studies minimum payments, and especially with uh, experimental variation. And we're going to be using this experimental variation to estimate causal effects on purchases, repayment, debt, and default. Uh, we believe this is a project that is uh, of interest both for policymakers and in the academic setting, because there's a concern that default and over-indebtedness has been caused through high interest rates and low minimum payments, and there's actually been some loss enacted uh, for, it, for this respect. Uh, this is still preliminary, so any comments would be very welcomed. So um, let me motivate this for a little bit. Uh, expanding credit to uh, new borrowers has been a policy priority in many countries around the world. This uh, quote by the Mexican Minister of Treasury, well, the former one, who said that uh, financial inclusion is not only a matter of finance, but of social equality as well. And while governments do not go out and actively give loans to people, they do seek that private lenders such as banks or credit unions uh, do it uh, in their respective countries. And how do they usually do it? Well, it's through credit cards. 72% of individuals uh, that have access to formal credit in Mexico did that through credit cards. And uh, while this paints a good picture, it's not a complete one, since only 22% of Mexican households in 2012 had a card. If you compare the same statistic uh, in the same year in, uh, with the US, uh, that was 77%. So this means there's still a lot to be done in this respect. And so why do we think that it's important to expand access to new borrowers? Well, 
As many of the past speakers have said, this allows the individual to smooth consumption and it should be uh, also well for improving in general uh, by reveal preference, like if you give people the choice to do something, uh, at least that should make them better off. But not everything is good as there's, uh, like the credit market is in general a textbook example of a market with uh, asymmetric information. And as we saw in the previous panel, it could be the case that unsophisticated or time inconsistent borrowers could end up borrowing too much relatively to an unbiased uh, benchmark. If you combine individuals with a lot of debt, uh, with, I don't know, income shocks or unemployment shocks, the story might not look that good. So what happened was that a large private bank, Mexican bank, decided to conduct an experiment to understand the effects of contract terms on debt and, defo and default. And uh, when I say uh, private bank, just imagine, I don't know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, decided to test this into their uh, uh, consumers. We came to this project in 2013, and the experiment was actually run from 2007 to 2009. So to our eyes, this is, in general, like a natural occurring experiment where we had no choice whatsoever. Uh, but given the, that the experiment happened, we're going to present and discuss uh, two specific issues. The first one is that we're going to try to measure exactly how much risk do new borrowers represent. And as a spoiler alert, we're going to uh, document high default and condition on, on defaulting. Individuals take too much debt with them that banks had to end up writing as losses because they end up selling it for like eight cents on the dollar. Uh, we're also going to document like hard card turnover and high variance in revenue. And this variance in revenue cannot be explained through observables. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the high default but, and the card exit, but I'm not going to cover in the interest of time the variance in revenue. And the second big question is whether contract terms can help mitigate the, uh, the debt and the default. And to do this, we're going to measure uh, our treatment effects uh, of changes in interest rates and minimum payments on purchases, payments, debt, and default. And why do we include pur purchases and payments? Well, debt in reality is a stock variable that is composed by how much you end up using your credit card and how much you end up paying to it. So to fully understand the debt, we kind of need to understand purchases and payments in the process. So uh, let me briefly introduce the product. Uh, this is a store credit card uh, for clients that was uh, intended uh, for clients sorry, with limited credit history and targeted at low income levels. Um, by th uh, this, is pro this product started in 2002, and by 2007, it already had 3.3 million clients. And uh, our study population is going to be the current card holders as of January 2007. And this is important as many of the past studies have studied like in general the extensive margin, but we're going to keep the customer base fixed, so this is more on the intensive margin. Um, for 57% of these individuals, this was the first uh, credit card of any kind, and for 40% of individuals, this was the first banking product whatsoever. As you might imagine, if it was your first banking product, it's also your first credit card, but not the other way around. Uh, I'm going to skip that just for time, and how does the, treatment, the experiment actually look like? We have eight treatment arms, each of them composed by 18,000 individuals, and a control group also of 18,000 individuals. So if we combine these nine groups, we have 162,000 individuals, and uh, uh, for, for everyone in the treatment, we're going to assign them to a combination of an interest rate and a minimum payment. What I mean by minimum payment is the, is the minimum amount that you have to pay today in order not to be delinquent tomorrow. And this is going to be in terms of a percentage, which is between 5 and 10 percent. So uh, if you have to pay 5 percent of your monthly balance, then uh, that's exactly the amount that you're going to have to cover in order not to be delinquent. So a combination between the interest rates that goes from like 15, 25, 35, and 45, uh, combined with a minimum payment between 5 and 10 percent, is going to uh, assign everyone a treatment group. Uh, there's also going to be a control arm, as I mentioned, that has on average an interest rate of 47 and a minimum payment of 4. This was like, this control group allows us to measure what would have happened in the market absent of any experiment. And clients were informed of the new interest rates and minimum payments in their usual monthly statements. And uh, the, once, you, once you got assigned a treatment, uh, you uh, remained on that treatment from March 2007 to, March, to May 2009. After that, all clients were returned to the same treatment arms. And what happened was that the bank gave us all of the monthly statement data from 2007 to 2009, and uh, there's actually a type over there, it should be from 2007 to 2014. Uh, and what, 
What we did in collaboration with the central bank is to take the credit card numbers, send them to the credit bureau, and file a request so that the credit bureau sent us all of the information of these clients. So for these clients, we are able to observe all of their loans, including like mortgage loans, car loans, uh, and student loans. Um, so this is a small timeline of the experiment. As I mentioned, the strata variables were recorded in January 2007, and the experiment lasted from March 2007 and May 2009. Oh, the Font is too small. Uh, well, and we have a uh, credit bureau snapshots uh, uh, from June 2007, June 2008, and June 2009. And each of these snapshots allow us to go six years back in time. So we have a lot of information on these individuals. And uh, finally, we also have some bank information from 2010 and to 2014, as I mentioned, which allows us to see once the experiment ended, what happened with individuals who were subject to different contract terms. Uh, how does the average individual look like? Well. The average individual is 39 years old, half of them are male and half of them are female, and six out of them of them are married. This is a good moment for uh, the peso, oh, sorry, the peso in general, because to transform that to dollars, you just have to divide by 10. Now we have to divide by 19, which is kind of more difficult. <laughs> uh, so on average, these individuals have thank you, um, uh, $1,300 uh, in income, and they pay $70 and purchase around $38 uh, and they have a debt of around $120. So the debt divided by, by their monthly income is around 10%. The credit limit of these cards is around $800, and the credit score is around 645. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a FICO score, but to some extent it's not comparable to the US one, so please do not draw any conclusions on whether these guys are credit worthy or not out of this number. Uh, so let's go quickly to the results. Let me just, yeah. So, Using the control group, the guys who didn't have an experiment of them, we documented that a third of our sample lives uh, by the end of the experiment. And this implies like a 15% uh, turnover rate uh, every year. We were uh, quite puzzled by this fact, and we actually went to the bank officials and told them like, look, maybe there's something wrong with the data. But then they were like, oh, this is normal for the market. So uh, how does this composition look like? Uh, around 15% of the individuals ca cancel their card voluntarily, which means that they just take up their phones and tell them, that I don't want your card anymore. Around 14% of these individuals get their card revoked by the bank, which is, which is what actually the other way around. The bank calls them and tells them, like, you're not a uh, word of credit anymore. And there's a few other reasons why you would see a card disappearing. Like, the most important ones are inactive accounts, stolen, account uh, stolen accounts, lost credit cards, and, like, uh, whether cardholders die or not. So we actually have a randomized control trial on that, which is, I don't know, interesting. Uh, anyways, um, so the estimation outline for the randomized control trial is going to be <coughs> the following. So we have uh, vari uh, any, variable, any outcome variable Y that you may like uh, interacted with eight treatment dormies. We completely get rid of the control for a few reasons that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. And uh, we also have like strata fix effect. So this uh, beta is going to give us the mean conditional on strata for variable y. And since we have 26 months and we have six variables, uh, and I'm, I mean we have like nine strata, we could have like a gazillion uh, treatment effects. And the easiest way that we, that we found to present them were to focus on two contrasts. The first one is going to be the effect of an interest rate decrease holding minimum payment fixed at five. And what this is talking about is just the difference between the betas of, as you see, the minimum payment fixed at five and the interest rate decreasing. And when we talk about an, the effect of an increase in the, in the minimum payment, we're going to talk about uh, holding interest rate fixed at 45. So as you see over here, we hold interest rate fixed at the highest level and the minimum payment, at, uh, we, that's, what, that's what we change. Why did we choose the 45.5 group as our control uh, comparison? Well, as you may, may remember, this is the closest to the actual market level data on average. But this allows us to give like clean comparisons of changing just one variable while holding the other one constant. So um, on, the left, uh, on the left graphs, you're going to see cancellations. And on the right hand, you're going to see revocations. Uh, it's too small, sorry about that. And on the upper graphs, you're going to see minimum payment, and in the lower graphs, you're going to see interest rates. So first of all, what, like, what's the prior on, on our head when we see 
uh, banks increasing the minimum payment, well, probably less individuals are gonna find this product to be good and then more people are gonna cancel their card and since they have to pay more, more people are going to get their card revoked. Well, turns out that's the, exactly the way these two variables behave. Cancellations increased by 14% and revocations increased by 10%. If you remember, this is just a change of 5 percentage points in the, inter, in the minimum payment, so these are interesting effects. Now, for revocations, it's also, the story also goes the, the way that we expected. It's precisely the case that when you decrease interest rates, you're going to see the uh, cancellations decrease because it's now a much more interesting product. And like, as, uh, uh, to give you some context, uh, a 15% uh, uh, interest rate is, not, is, it's, is something that's very difficult to have in the Mexican credit market. So we, we, we actually expected no one to cancel their card, but we actually only got like a 30% 30, uh, 30 decrease in the cancellations. And revocations, while they increase in the short run, uh, sorry, uh, they end up decreasing in the long run. Um, so now let's talk about purchases and repayment. So thanks. Um, so as you might expect, if you increase the minimum payment, payments should increase in the short run. Why? Because you're forcing everyone to pay more. But since you're on, like, as a, uh, as a percent, or the, as a percent, you're forcing them to pay more in the short run, they will end up uh, accumulating less debt and less debt and less debt. And therefore, in dollar terms, they should be uh, paying less in the, in the long run. And there's no clear prior where should purchases go, as, like, if I think about uh, having a higher minimum payment, at least I would decrease my purchases because I would have to pay more of that uh, in the future. So while well, the first one, like, yeah, the first effect goes uh, with orientation, the second one does not. Uh, we kind of, like, we kind of go into detail in, in, in the paper, but we think this is just because of a stock uh, story. Like, since you're paying much more, you're, uh, you're, you end up having less debt, and therefore you see more space in your credit card, so you end up using it a little bit more. And the story of, uh, with interest rates is, also goes with our intuition. Like when you decrease interest rates, consumers are going to purchase a little bit more and payments are going to go a little bit down. Given, we, given and let me put it the other way. We, when you have higher interest rates, you end up uh, purchasing less and paying more out of what you purchased. Uh, so the intuition for the debt was uh, that if uh, interest compounding is small, then debt should decrease when you increase the interest rate. But this, I'm just going to show that this is not the case. So, as I mentioned, the debt for the minimum payments, like in the short run, it goes up, precisely because these guys didn't know they had to pay more, and then, they, like out of the sudden, they just saw a higher minimum payment, and then therefore the, this increases. But consistently, they started paying more and more and more, which meant that they, in the end they, they end up decreasing their debt. For the interest rate, this is the inter this is an interesting story because. As you see, when interest rate decreases, debt decreases. But let's put it the other way around. If you increase the interest rate, you're going to see customers paying more and purchasing less and still debt increasing. This, uh, like we were ki uh, kind of puzzled and thought our variable was wrong, but it turns out that it's actually because of interest compounding. So um, we find this uh, to be an interesting result. So let me go quickly through bank revenues. Uh, I just wanted to mention that are banks uh, uh, maximizing profits? So the answer is apparently yes, because if you decrease interest, uh, yeah, if you decrease interest rates or increase minimum payments, they're going to end up having less revenue from from the customers. This, however, means this, however, I need to I, I might be shooting myself on the foot, but it's uh, keeping the customer base fixed. So the other effect that we need to take into consideration is once you change the interest rates, what's the new selection of clients that you're going to have? Uh, so let me skip the summary just to talk about the other findings to motivate you guys to read the paper. Um, so we document uh, significant heterogeneity for our results. We, using our stratified sample, we are able to distinguish between minimum payers or, or individuals who are paying near the minimum uh, at the beginning of the experiment and individuals who are paying a lot, uh, uh, like the full depth in, at the beginning of the experiment. And we document that most of our effects come from the fact that minimum payers are the ones who are changing their behavior, and there's quite a few guys who are completely insensitive to their uh, contract terms. 
Also, we document the cost of default and we say that getting your card revoked by the bank is associated with a three times lower probability of getting a new card and your credit score decreases 70 points. Just to give a context on this, like a 550 credit score in Mexico would mean you're out of the credit market or the formal one, at least. And then we also document the external eff effects, and given that there's no, yeah, given that we observe all of the other, uh, all of these clients' other uh, the loans and bills, we kind of try to see whether there was like a spillover effect, and it turns out that there's no treatment effect on other loans, like phone bills, and or the total amount in arrears, or uh, the total uh, amount of credit cards that these guys defaulted. And uh, finally, we, use the after experiment uh, data to document that after the experiment, since all call holders were returned to the same interest rate, around 47, and a minimum payment for around four, uh, in 2011, these guys, like individuals who before, the, before because of the treatment were subject to a higher minimum payment, ended up like the difference was 5% between the minimum, pay, the minimum payments, and uh, they end up paying like 4.7 percentage points more. That's of course controlling for debt because uh, because they were have, uh, having to pay much more and more every month, uh, they ended up having a smaller stock of debt. And what we're working, working on right now is how to lar uh, reconcile this large underlying default rate uh, with insensit insensitivity to relatively large changes in contractual terms. So I guess that's all, but I have a bunch of slides, so I'm just going to click through them. Uh, and this, uh, this one, uh, I like the presentation in the launch. Is, it's exactly this figure. I was very happy to see <laughs> that this replicates on other uh, data sets. Okay, thank you. Okay, our final paper of the session will be presented by Camilla Summer on the effect of student loans on access to home ownership. So thank you very much for having me uh, come to present, talk to you about the, uh, the student loans and home ownership. This is a joint work with Alvaro Meza, uh, Daniel Ringo, and Shane Sherland, which are all my colleagues at the Federal Reserve Board. And as all um, of, the, of the presenters who are affiliated with institutions, I have to say that um, all the views which I'm going to present here today are only ours of the authors, and they don't reflect uh, the views of the board, the members, or the chair. So I think that if you read newspaper, the linkage or the proposed linkage between student loans and debt and home, between student loan debt and home ownership is not new. It has received a lot of attention um, in, in press and in policy debate um, in the last couple of years. And what people have frequently been talking about is about sort of this um, um, correlation, uh, which we have seen over the last 10 years, where um, the home ownership rate has plummeted from about 69% in 2005 to about 64%, um, 65% um, in 2015. And at the same time, we have been seeing very significant increases in student loan borrowing, uh, where student loan balances have increased from uh, about um, uh, $19,000 in, two, in 2005 to um, $27,000 uh, by 2015. So certainly, you know, we are not presenting this graph to say, look, this is causal. Um, you know, a lot of things happened and, you know, clearly we have had a very significant uh, recession with, uh, with a huge a uh, housing bust, which has been unprecedented since the, since the Great Recession. But nonetheless, the, the linkage um, and the policy debate has been uh, of importance um, across institutions, uh, especially given that student loan debt is now um, uh, over $1, uh, $1 trillion. So why people have been talking about this potential linkage between student loan and home ownership even further is because the, decrease, the decreases in the home, home ownership rate, which I have sh shown to the left, had been more pronounced for young people. So uh, in the right panel, you can see the decline in home ownership between 2005 and 2014. 
uh, for young people between ages 24 and 32. And for them, you can see that the home ownership rate has declined by 9 percentage points. For the overpopulation, the, uh, the decline has been less pronounced, and it has been uh, um, uh, it, it was it, the home ownership rate declined by about five percentage points. Given that young people are more likely to own student loan debt, um, it would not be surprising that, that some of this could be driven by the increases in student loan borrowing we have seen. So. Uh, Besides the anecdotes you could read, or, uh, you could read in the paper, uh, there has been also a lot of survey evidence which has suggested that really there could be this linkage and that student loans could be waiting, uh, down, uh, waiting uh, on home ownership. Uh, so, for example, student loan debt um, has been associated with um, lower home ownership in, uh, in, in surveys by Rutgers, National Association of Realtors, or by Fannie Mae. The narrative uh, of where you survey people, they frequently talk about these student loan debts um, are reducing my ability to qualify for a mortgage because I don't have big enough of down payment, it's weighing on my debt to income ratio, um, and you know, potentially it's affecting my credit score. Um, additional channel which you could think of in terms of very, uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of the effect of student loans on home ownership would be sort of this idea that maybe borrowers are risk averse and that if you already have some debt, student loan debt from college, maybe you are a little bit hesitant to, or you want to wait a little bit longer and pay off some of this student loan debt before you take on this additional massive debt, which is a home loan. So certainly in the context of the discussion about debt, student loan debt is not special. It could be any type of a debt, uh, especially in the context of risk aversion or uh, debt to income ratios, which, would be, which could be waiting on home ownership. Why uh, student loans are interesting is because they are really, really uh, significant liability for very young households. For many young households, this might be even one of their first um, uh, first real debts um, they get settled with. Um, and then this is also a debt uh, to the extent that it's largely accessible through the federal programs, that it's not underwritten and so it's available also to marginal borrowers. So in the paper, we will be asking the following research questions. All else equal, how does variation in student loan debt affect the probability of home ownership? And in this analysis, we'll hold closely related educational decision constants. Constants of, yeah, essentially, in a way, comparing two people who are identical in terms of observable characteristics, including the educational attainment. And the thought experiment we will conduct in the experiment um, in, in the paper is something along the lines, what would happen if we would forgive one of these two people $1,000 in student loan debt, which has been accrued through age of 22? So certainly you could imagine, uh, here we are stacking uh, the deck a little bit against um, uh, student loans, uh, in a sense that if I take two identical people and I uh, give one uh, more student loan debt, I mean, it, it's not inconceivable that uh, his uh, entry into home ownership could be delayed or impacted. Uh, of course, access to student loan debt could have positive externalities, so to the extent that maybe being able to borrow for, to fund education, um, allows you to get more education, and through that step into higher income down the road, uh, there could be this general equilibrium income effect, which we would not be uh, um, capturing in our analysis, but that could be very positive, right, in, in terms of sort of a social welfare. But, so we are literally looking at this question, all else equal. So one, one, one problem with uh, studying uh, issues pertaining to student loan debt is that student loan debt is endogenous. So, so there can be many unobservable factors which might influence both borrowing, uh, student loan borrowing, and home ownership, and those could bias the results. So for example, you could think about students who, because they are expecting high future income, they borrow a little bit more, or they maybe go into more expensive, expensive degrees or school. So that would create a, a bias in the analysis. Also, you could imagine a situation when tight credit markets could restrain student loans from um, additional borrowing, for example, through private market, and that could restrict their access also to home loans. 
And there are also many other demographic factors which you really which you really would like to observe if you were to conduct selection on observable type of analysis. Um, but those might not be available in the data sets, which also have detailed information on student loans and schooling information, which you need, which you need to, conduct, to, to conduct this type of analysis. So um, we, uh, in the spirit of our lunch talk, we will be actually exploiting a brand new data set, uh, um, sort of a pretty unique data set, which is combining um, administrative da uh, data from several data sources to estimate the effect of student loan debt on entry into home ownership. So specifically, we'll be using credit bureau records, but not, uh, not from Equifax, from the New York panel, but uh, instead we'll be using TransUnion data. Uh, and then um, we actually managed to have additional records uh, merged on it. In, in this particular case, this would be federal student loans and Pell Grant information. Um, and we've gotten it directly from the Department of Education. And also we are able to get records on college enrollment, graduation major and school characteristics, which we are getting from National Student Clearinghouse. And then we'll be using um, IV um, approach that will be using changes in tuition rates at home state public universities to identify the effect. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of move to existing studies so, because the talk is short. So in terms of um, existing studies, they have been studies which have been trying to estimate the effect of student loans on home ownership, but they were mostly able to do it in sort of in a, in, a, in a framework which is controlling on observables, which could be suffering from these uh, omitted variable biases, which I have uh, described on the previous slide. Uh, these studies generally find small effects, so for example, uh, of, of increased student loan debt on home ownership. So for example, Cooper, uh, Cooper and Wang and Hull and Berger in their respective studies find that a 10% increase in student loan debt decreases home ownership rate by 10 to 15 basis points for, for young borrowers. So let me first tell you a little bit about the sample we'll be using. This is going to be a representative cohort of individuals uh, who were between ages 23 and 31 in 2004. Uh, we, uh, for these individuals, um, we, uh, these individuals to be in our data needed to have a credit record at the time. Uh, those credit records are source, sourced from TransUnion and TransUnion data are available um, uh, for these borrowers uh, always as a snapshot at a time, roughly biannually between 1997 and 2000, uh, actually 2014, be because we were able to extend the data set now. And, you know, we certainly uh, don't uh, have a definitive um, indicator of home ownership status of a household, but we can um, approximate home ownership by presence of secure close end mortgage debt. So, I mean, if you bought a home with a, with a mortgage, we would say that you are a homeowner. Of course, there could be cash buyers, but we think that these are very young people. This is not likely to, uh, to be much of an issue in terms of our analysis. Then we have these additional histories uh, by National Student Clearinghouse, where we have detailed enrollment spells on duration of each enrollment at a given institution, and we also have graduation records. And for the people who have graduated, we know their degree and major. And because we have the institutional characteristics, we are also able to uh, merge it further with um, uh, iPads data and actually learn, you know, and, and, and learn about is this institution for profit, is it a public for, et cetera. And then finally, we have Pell uh, Grant and federal loan records by the Department of, Educa of Education. So, you know, um, I, because it's a quite different uh, data set, we thought that it was quite, uh, it would be quite helpful to first do something similar to what other studies have done when you are doing selection of observables. So we actually regressed indicator for home ownership constructed from TransUnion data on individuals uh, student loan debt accumulated by the age of, or accru uh, disbursed to the student by the age of 22. And then we control for a rich set of individual characteristics which are measured at the age of 22 as well as state and fixed year effects. And uh, then what we estimate uh, very reassuringly is similar to, similar to what some of these other studies have estimated, which is a very small effect when we find that a $1,000 increase in student loan debt decreases the home ownership 
um, in the early in the ages up to approximately age 30 by about 10 to 20 basis points. Um, in our sample, $10,000, uh, $1,000 is approximately 7% of the average balance. So sort of quantitatively, it seems to be quite a similar effect to what the, some of the other studies have been finding. So um, now uh, with that in mind, you know, we move to the omitted variable bias um, um, to addressing the omitted variable bias and also to, to our IV. So what essentially for the IV, what we need is an instrument for student loan debt that does not affect decision for home ownership through any other channel than that. And so our candidate IV are increases in average tuition and public four-year universities in people's home state when um, the individual was 18 to 22 years old. So we essentially kind of look, you know, what would be the total tuition if you were living um, in, um, at, 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 what would be the total increase in tuition for the people in this group. So the treatment group are, uh, so the idea here, why, this is a, why we think this is a good instrument is that the home state tuition changes uh, are not really determined by individual choices, right? So for example, when tuitions are being said, it's not really related to um, choices of any individual, individual, individual. And of course, because we are also looking at your home state to the extent that this is a state you've been living sort of as, uh, a teenager, so, you know, this is less likely to be uh, affected by your personal choice to move to that state to attend college later on. Um, we, within the IV framework, we also use a treatment control type of a setup where essentially our treatment group will be individuals who attended a public four-year university by age 22 and um, other same cohort, same state individuals form the control group. And this will essentially help us to, um, to account for um, potential sort of state specific effects between these, uh, which could be affecting these trends. We will absorb the state uh, and time specific shocks, which are correlated with tuition by controlling for it. And then, you know, you might be concerned that in this type of a setup, we might, peop, um, tuition increases might be, or tuition changes, uh, might be also affecting enrollment choices on individuals. So later on, as part of a validity, we show that tuition changes are un generally uncorrelated with attendance at public for each school, so we don't need to worry too much about endogenous selection bias. Okay. So let me just actually uh, um, skip to the main results. So uh, here I am actually plotting for you the OLS estimate, which I've shown you on the previous slide, and this is the blue line with uh, uh, the dashed area representing, uh, representing the 95% confidence interval. And then I'm actually comparing it with the red line, solid line, which is the estimated effect through our IV, uh, through our IV approach. And you can actually see that the effect which we estimate, it's much stronger. Uh, the effect increases in a, in a way as you would expect as you get uh, away from the age of 22 and more to your uh, uh, prime buying ages. Um, and, and it's statistically significant between ages 26 to 29. After that, there seems to be a sign of attenuation of the effect, but we cannot also tell very much because uh, the confidence intervals are very uh, wide. Um, so, so here just to put um, the, uh, the estimated uh, effect into context of a life cycle, the blue line is plotting for you the home ownership profile for the treated group, which are the people who have uh, gone to public four-year universities in their home state. And you can see, you can see that the home ownership rate for these people is declining pretty sharply of between ages 22 and 32, from about less than 10% to 60% by the age of 32, right? So, and then um, the uh, red line uh, is plotting the same, uh, is essentially plotting the home ownership for this treated group uh, under the assumption that we treat them with $1,000 more of that. Okay, so 
um, some of the main things that you would be worried about would be something like that these tuition changes are being driven by some sort of a state, uh, state shocks, which might be affecting not only the tuitions, but also home ownership. Um, so, you know, to the best of our ability, we think that we have been controlling for it with the tuition me measure in our, uh, in our uh, empirical design. Uh, when we throw in uh, some additional uh, local economic controls like the state average uh, wages, state unemployment rate and state house prices, the results are unchanged. Um, and um, essentially, if we did an additional specification when we, are, when we would be using um, cohort by state effects uh, and the tuition would drop out, um, we, it would be the same. And the last thing is the one I've alluded uh, sort of early on, this idea that maybe increases in tuition or changes in tuition might be affecting selection into, um, into college or into attendance of public four-year universities. And so here we are essentially plotting the probability of attending a public four-year university by, by the age of 22. Um, and um, you can see that um, essentially this, the decision, the effect of increases in tuition um, doesn't really affect uh, the probability of attending public four-year university with statistical significance. So, um, you know, conclusions. Uh, we have, uh, there is some evidence that omitted variable bias, um, that there is omitted variable bias present in studies uh, which are based solely on observable controls. Once the omitted variable bias is addressed, uh, student loan debt can have an economically meaningful effect on student loan home ownership uh, of borrowers. Uh, we are estimating with a statistical significance uh, mostly between ages 26 to 29. Um, uh, effect seems to be the strongest between the late, the, these late 20s and then seems to attenuate sort of later on, but again, we cannot say because of the precision. And then channels which are outside, of the, uh, outside the scope of our analysis are the following. So when we estimate this effect, this is largely done on people who have, um, uh, who have made their home ownership decisions, or at least some of them, prior to the crisis. Some of them did it during the crisis and post-crisis, so it's a little bit of a mixed sample. So it's not necessarily clear, though, that um, the, you know, the changes in mortgage underwriting, which we have seen, for example, would not be affecting our results. Um, if we were to uh, take this estimated sensitivity and think about uh, cohorts who are entering the market now. Um, and additionally, there is this positive externality potentially from student loans, um, which, um, which could allow um, borrowers to tap into more education and consequently higher incomes, and we are not able to say much about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all of our presenters for presenting these papers. Scott's now going. Scott Fulford is now going to discuss them. Thank you. Uh, Scott Fulford, I'm an economist in the Office of Research at the uh, CFPB, and the views expressed here are my own and don't re represent those of CFPB and or uh, the United States. So, and I think, uh, so it's the job of the speaker, uh, of the last speaker in the first session after lunch to either finally put you back to sleep or I hope to wake you back up again. Uh, now, the problem is I can't make you do jumping jacks the way my third grade teacher used to do. Well, Ron is actually suggesting maybe I can, but I think I probably shouldn't. Instead, I'm going to try to do the mental equivalent. So what I want you to at, think about is I'm going to try to summarize each of these papers in exactly one sentence. And what I want you to think about is whether I have actually done so correctly, in the sense that whether I've captured what the paper said, whether I've left something important out, and crucially, whether I've used a semicolon incorrectly to cheat. So with that said, oops, oh boy, there we are. With that said, I think that one of the things that we've learned is that people do respond to credit and it increases in credit by using it, even when they are not close to their limit. So that's paper one. But using credit is also a costly signal. And so you actually can reduce your credit in the future, although this only may be the case for those for whom the signal actually matters, for whom there's actually a response. It's really hard to tell who is a good credit risk, particularly when you have no uh, history. And so establishing a credit history has an externality, semicolon, Contract terms don't help much. And finally, holding income fixed, having at least one kind of debt, uh, such as student loans, reduces the use of other kinds of debt, 
or other kinds of credit in which to acquire durable goods like houses. Okay, so with the summary out of way, I think it's useful to step back and think a little bit about the context in which we're thinking about credit in multiple situations. And I actually want to start with uh, going way back in time uh, to one of the foundational papers that's come up again and again. Uh, so this is Angus Deaton's Savings and Liquidity Constraints, which introduced was one of the foundational papers for thinking about buffer stocks. And I'm actually wearing my bow tie today in honor of Angus, who, wears, who still wears them to this day, I think, to teach. So the important part about this set of models here we go, is that what it allows us to do is think through how much people are going to consume given the amount of resources they have today. So on the x-axis here, what you put together is how much available liquidity you have. So that's the combination of income and assets. So it's all the things you can spend right now. And then the question is how much of that are you going to spend today? And there are a couple of really important parts to look through through this graph. The first is that for people who are very poor today, have very few, little assets today, they're going to consume basically everything they have. So in economic terms, and we've heard this term again and again uh, over the last two days, their marginal propensity to consume, that's the slope of this, their marginal propensity to consume is one. And a different way of saying that is if you give them an extra dollar, they're going to spend an extra dollar. But there are other people who are richer, who are going to spend less than their full available assets right now. And the difference between how much they spend and how much they have is going to go into savings, which they can use in the next period. And with some additional work, you can show that under some assumptions, there are going to be some distributions, and so people are going to kind of bounce around in there, depending on what kind of shocks they get hit by. So this basic framework has been used again and again. We've actually seen this occur again and again in papers today, and in, including within, within these papers. So just to give you a sense, I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Uh, Chris Carroll used it to talk about buffer stock savings and life cycle perm income hypothesis. Uh, Gernsus and Parker added some life cycle elements to it. Uh, Kabosky and Townsend recently used it with adding some uh, durable goods investment or some investment in, uh, in, a, in a savings vehicle. And they added a difference that what ha what's happening when you're changing available uh, credit. And this guy, who must be really smart because he's using three colors, three, that's so much more than everybody else was using, put some fairly general, uh, showed that some of these things are very general and thought about how they look and change over time. And notice that this guy, who happens to be me, just in case the joke didn't quite hit, uh, is thinking about these things in India. So this is a big kind of body of research of which I've only taken a several papers. But I think it's useful to sort of do a quick sort of thinking about what this body of research has, sort of, has suggested. And the first is that if people are using credit either to smooth shocks or to make investments in actual income producing things or in durable goods, then credit is valuable. And so changes in credit are going to change behavior. And we would expect that there's going to be substantial heterogeneity in the response, again, because there's that heterogeneity in the consumption function, in the way that people are responding anyway. Uh, but you wouldn't expect a whole lot of heterogeneity in overall what's called in, the, uh, in this uh, literature permanent income, so that you might actually be able to compare pretty readily people in Thailand, Mexico, or the United States. That doesn't mean that they are all, they all have the same level of income, but it means that our understanding of the way they're behaving might have similar, uh, similar uh, approaches. The second is that if you increase, if increases in credit allow people to do things now that they couldn't do before, that's great, but in the long term, they're still acquiring debt, and debt is costly. So using credit is going to have consequences for future consumption, and we're going to expect these consequences to appear over time. So there's going to be a separate part of heterogeneity that's going to happen over time. So with those sort of basic thoughts, I kind of want to think through what we've learned from these papers going uh, a little bit more detail. So the exciting thing about the marginal propensity to consume out of liquidity is that it really provides some really precise experimental evidence that, hap that helps us really kind of think about what's happening as our credit changes. So in, in particular, this is really exciting because increases in credit limits are actually affecting all of the borrowers. And so we're actually learning a lot about how that heterogeneity maps out across the consumption function. So that said, I want to actually talk a little bit about sort of some of the details that I think are really relevant here that are actually sort of exciting and are somewhat distinct from the US market. 
So credit card contracts within this US, European institution have this really interesting features that combine the kind of standard payments aspect of credit cards. So we sometimes call those convenience or transaction use with revolving use. So you can decide to pay, some, uh, pay for something now and pay interest on it and revolve it in the future with a kind of installment contract, where essentially you're saying, I'm going to pay for something now, and I'm going to promise to pay for it in these set intervals. And what that's really interesting is it actually gives us some really interesting insights into the way that people think about the way that they're using credit. I should say that it seems that the installment contract seems to be at least a little bit notional, because it seems like you can translate the installment loan into revolving debt more or less costlessly. So it's not entirely clear that just because you're calling it an installment loan, you can't just turn it into revolving debt. But uh, it still is an interesting way of thinking about how different people view credit. OK, let me think about the high cost debt in borrowing reputation. So, one way to think about some of the changes that we were seeing along that marginal propensity to consume as you change the liquidity constraints is that if you make use of your credit, that actually means that you're actually making the cost of using credit even higher. So you're not just paying interest, but you may actually be harming your future ability to use credit. Uh, and so this in some sense raises the price of credit. It makes it more expensive because you're actually harming your ability to do something in the future. This actually makes it in some ways almost harder to understand people using these really high cost debt because the interest rates are already really high and there's a lot of debate, which some of which we've seen in the conference over the last two days, to think about well, how, why are people willing to take on so much debt? And when you add to the cost, it makes it even a little bit harder. Uh, I think it's worthwhile noting that some of the particulars here are specific to the United Kingdom, where credit scores are partly depend on information, uh, on information from uh, these high cost payday style lenders. So that's not actually the case in the United States right now, although there's, an extent, there's a growing uh, subprime credit bureau industry. Uh, however, to the extent that you think that, say, for example, using more of your credit limit on a uh, credit card might make your score go down, the same basic thoughts apply. There's still a reputation consequence. So the particulars may not be exactly the same, but the, uh, but the general thought actually is pretty, um, uh, is pretty general. I, I did have a brief question, a brief thought on the regression discontinuity, uh, which I think I actually, I'll, I'll bring up uh, with the authors later just on, in terms of uh, time. Uh, Finally, I want to think a little bit about mitigating the, uh, or finally, uh, financial inclusion with loan contracts. And just to sort of thinking about one of the interesting things about thinking about development economics and thinking about how people get credit is that credit doesn't just appear out of thin air. Uh, it, and this paper is really helping us understand how you go from no formal credit to formal credit. And I think it, it's sort of worthwhile to remember that profit-seeking firms may not always find it valuable to offer credit particularly in low information environments. So with people without credit risk, without credit histories, they might actually not be very good credit risks, but firms who discover who's a good credit risk are providing a really valuable externality. Uh, that valuable externality actually might benefit competitors, uh, which unfortunately means that there might actually be too little of this very risky lending because there's an information value that's being provided for free to other members of the, uh, m other members of the market. Uh, and unfortunately, I think one of the things I learned from this paper is that it doesn't seem like you can make contracts that are going to solve this easily, or at least uh, from the, any of the ones in the papers, uh, they didn't seem to be able to solve this sort of externality problem in an easy way. Okay, on the effect of student loans on, uh, on home ownership. So increasing the cost of education. Uh, and so the loans are to acquire it. And what that means is that essentially there's going to be left, le less income left over in the future. So one way to read this paper is it's not so much about the increase in student loan debt. It's really about the decrease in available disposable income left over for all the other things you might care about. So a way to read this within the whole framework that we've been looking at is this is really going to affect the intertemporal budget constraint. So thinking about why credit matters uh, even for those who aren't near their credit limit, well, this is essentially people have lower income of which they can spend a bunch of things. Uh, so, oh, there we are. Ah, okay. Uh, a brief caveat on this, it was not clear to me that the welfare consequences of the shift in portfolio, which this is implying, are super large. 
Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Essentially what people are doing is they're choosing to consume their available disposable income by acquiring fewer, dispo uh, fewer durable goods, which require uh, constant payments, and perhaps instead to be renting, which has different kinds of fixed, uh, d different kinds of costs. So there are, it's not clear that the welfare consequences of the shift in, buy in owning less are large, particularly because the savings aspect of paying down debt are the same. You still got this student loan debt, which you have to pay down, Otherwise, you might have a mortgage debt, which you have to pay down. So you're still acquiring additional, uh, additional um, uh, debts. Instead, actually, I think that the, maybe the larger consequences are actually buried in the first stage of their regression, which is that there's an 1% inc increase in the cost of tuition implies a 1.3% increase in student loan debt. Now, I want to be careful. If that were dollar to dollar, that would actually be a big deal because it would imply that taking less money or uh, that a lower public provision of something was increasing the total cost of the thing. I don't think that that's actually what it implies. I don't think the percentage terms actually work out that way. But by itself, I think that that's actually a really useful thing to understand what, how that translation of public to private is actually happening. So I'm just about out of time. I want to sort of just highlight two things that I think were really important in thinking about these papers, uh, which uh, Bridget already in some sense has mentioned. One is just the exciting use of a administ large administrative data sets. And what's exciting about these is they all had both the administrative side, but also some really great partnership with some institution which was getting them an additional extra information. So there was an experiment. They were emerging some education records. There was a change in bank credit limits. And this is really exciting. It just really does a lot more. And finally, just to again highlight, these were from four different countries. Um, and so some of the things that we're learning are really about learning across the heterogeneity of countries and that many of the commonalities are actually larger than the differences. Okay. All right, so I think we have time for just a couple of questions. One question. Make it good. Question to Andres, um, can you elaborate on the reputational damage? What do you mean by that? Because it's interesting, uh, so what you're saying is if I am a borrower and I take out a loan from Wonga versus like Barclay, Wonga is like payday lender, um, then it's gonna impact my credit score? Because I mean, there's an inquiry that will impact my credit score, there's a utilization, but how is like, is there a ranking for, because I, I'm not aware of the same thing in the United States, so. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's a super interesting question. So, one thing is we control, so one, one concern you may have is just this is, an, this is capturing an increase in leverage, right? So, one way to kind of mitigate that concern is that we don't see the same effect for the low credit score individuals who are also increasing their leverage. Another possibility uh, that, that we test in the paper is just controlling for initial leverage. We see the same, exactly the same effects. Now to the heart of your question is, and I have no evidence to, to back this up, but we suspect that the signal depends on where you're borrowing from. And so in particular, there is, you know, in the US, in your credit record, you get marked for when you, when there's a hard pull on your credit record for a credit card application. And so that could be viewed as a positive signal, it could be viewed as a negative signal. I think there's interesting work to be done in that dimension. I think if you want to apply for a home equity line of credit, it's very hard to argue that's gonna be seen as a, as a negative signal. And so you can think of a spectrum of borrowing possibilities, each with a different signal. Um, but again, this is a conjecture and I have no evidence to back that. Okay, we have time for one more question. If anybody has one right now. Okay, well, if it comes to you, uh, we have a 30 minute break right now, so you can come seek out our panelists. Um, we'll return here at 3.50 for the final panel on information and disclosure. Uh, if we could thank our panelists one more time.